As we enter the era of Trump, the era of Republican domination, at least for a while at the federal level, it's important to remember that there are many other fights, many other fronts in the struggle. Here to talk about that with us now and to give us maybe a more positive perspective on what can be done is Steve Early. Steve is a longtime veteran of the labor movement. He's been an organizer, a lawyer, a union rep, a labor activist for the past 45 years. He's written three books already, including Save Our Unions, Dispatches from a Movement in Distress, and his new book is entitled Refinery Town, Big Oil, Big Money, and the Remaking of an American City. Steve, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on, Richard. Oh, it's a pleasure. And uh, I want to start off by saying uh, your book, Refinery Town, uh, include, has an introduction, a foreword by none other than uh, than a guy I knew a little bit, uh, Bernie Sanders, my old boss. And in it, he says, to change US politics, we need more cities like Richmond, California. Uh, why does he say that? What is it about Richmond, California that provides a model for changing politics? Well, Bernie has been a great uh, supporter and friend of our local progressive movement here in Richmond. Uh, the book, Refinery Town, is about its development over the last 15 years. Uh, the main organization catalyzing change in this city, long dominated by uh, Chevron Corporation, is a multiracial membership organization called the Richmond Progressive Alliance. And the RPA, as it's known locally, uh, has been very successful, more so probably than any other similar group uh, anywhere in the country except Vermont, uh, running candidates for municipal office and then using city hall positions, including the mayor's uh, office for eight years, uh, to implement uh, much needed innovative public policy uh, changes and programs that have made Richmond a much more livable and just and equitable place for its 80% uh, non-white population. Um, it's a city of 110,000 predominantly black and Latino. And uh, Bernie has been helping us out both in our 2014 and 2016 municipal elections. And in those two election cycles, we elected five progressive candidates to the city council. We now have a uh, city council supermajority of, of uh, five out of seven. And uh, thanks to him in, in part. And, you know, one of the reasons why the politics of Richmond, California are so significant, Steve Early, uh, we always like to see uh, progressive victories at the local level. But, uh, you know, the other significant thing about Richmond, and I used to live in that area, although not in Richmond itself, is that it is, as you say, a refinery town. Uh, Chevron is there. Chevron has a major installation there and chevron has thrown around a lot of money trying to get its way in the city of richmond right it definitely has uh, along with other business interests uh, in our last three election cycles 2012 2014 and last fall uh, combined spending by uh, big uh, business interests uh, big oil big soda and most recently the landlord lobby a uh, total more than seven million dollars in direct expenditures uh, all of these interest groups are trying to defeat progressive candidates or last fall a rent control referenda, which was uh, successful. And I think it really is a case study in how grassroots organization can defeat big money in politics. Uh, Bernie came and helped us uh, do that by raising money for our candidates uh, two years ago and his uh, post-campaign organization, Our Revolution, uh, supported two Richmond City Council candidates last fall and, and helped raise money for them. And that definitely leveled the playing field. But we have been up against some big bucks here, uh, but have been able to win nevertheless. Well, let's talk about moves and counter moves, if we can, for a second, Steve Early, uh, in the, re the refinery town of Richmond, California. So how did that big money get spent influencing Richmond politics? Well, as I describe in my book, which focuses on the 2014 uh, mayoral race and city council election, uh, thanks to our great uh, Supreme Court and its Citizens United uh, decision, uh, most spending by corporate interests like Chevron is, of course, not in the form of 
campaign contributions to individual candidates. Uh, Chevron has created a series of independent expenditure committees and proceeds then in every election cycle, the less so last year, uh, to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars supposedly independent of its favored uh, corporate-oriented uh, Democrats. And these ind independent expenditures are unrestricted. They do have to be reported in California, but uh, they give candidates with business backing a huge edge in terms of mailings, billboards, TV and radio ads, and Internet presence. And only through systematic grassroots organization and, and uh, base building can you overcome that huge advantage. You know, one of the things that I think has happened among progressives, Steve, is that I think there gets to be a sense of despair or, or, or fatalism. You, they see the flyers, they see the mailers. If it's a larger scale election, of course, they see ads and uh, television ads and so on. But they see all the economic force arrayed against them and they think, well, you know, you just can't win against that. What was different about Richmond? And now you guys elected a progressive mayor. You passed a uh, you passed a progressive uh, rent law. What what was different there? What how where did the success come from? I think there's a couple of elements. One is human scale. It's a city, as I mentioned, 110,000 active electorate of 30 to 40,000 people. Uh, if you build up a membership organization like the Richmond Progressive Alliance and you function year-round as a community organizing vehicle, you get involved in issue-oriented campaigns and you don't just pop up every two or four years at election time, uh, you have a different kind of uh, political base. The RPA has been able to mobilize at election time two, three, four hundred volunteers to go out months in advance of election day to knock on doors, to canvas, to ID voters, and then to get out those voters uh, when, it's, when it's time to cast a ballot. Uh, the opposition, though much more heavily funded, relies heavily on paid media, on high-priced consultants, and on paid canvassers. And when a paid canvasser comes to your door versus a neighbor talking about local issues, I can tell you, uh, you know the difference. Yeah, you know, and I want to talk to you about something. And again, we're talking with Steve Early, author of the book Refinery Town, Big Oil, Big Money, and the Remaking of an American City. And it's a great story, by the way. But I want to talk to you about something, Steve, that a, 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 you're talking about paid Democratic canvassers, paid Democratic consultants, and, and some of us know that culture and know its weak points. But one of the things you hear uh, from Democratic consultants all the time is that voters who would lean Democratic, and I'm thinking demographically, you hear them say this specifically about the kinds of voters uh, that comprise the majority of Richmond, California, African-American voters, uh, lower income voters, uh, Latino voters, and so on. They'll say, well, you know, those folks don't turn out to vote. That's part of the sort of uh, uh, bubble in the bubble wisdom of democratic consultants but clearly that's not that wasn't the case in richmond uh, is that a fair statement uh yeah i mean we we are not free of the usual impediments to electoral participation we have a lot of uh, uh folks here who are immigrants from uh south america and latin america uh, who are not eligible to vote uh, others are not uh, registered to vote um, and the problem of ap apathy and disengagement from electoral politics is uh, no more of a challenge here than, than anywhere else. I think what has made a difference is that progressives have been very well attuned to the kinds of issues that are not just global in nature, but uh, also very pressing, important neighborhood concerns. Uh, reforming the police department, making sure that uh, Chevron doesn't have accidents that expose people to uh, toxic clouds of, uh, of uh, carbon emissions, uh, making sure that housing remains affordable in this part of the Bay Area with its tremendous gentrification pressures. Uh, the fact that there's a multi-issue program, people doing year-round work on behalf of it, and then people working on the inside as mayor, as city council member, uh, really is a very powerful form of grassroots synergy.
Yeah, you know, that's exactly, and that was exactly my point, Steve, that you guys, of course, are not immune to the, these these broader problems of voter, uh, you could call it apathy, you could call it discouragement. You could say that they don't feel there's anybody out there speaking for them. It's not that you're immune to it, but it's that you're, you, you've been able to, to a certain extent to counteract that. And I think there's a lesson in that, you know, you and I remember when people would say, uh, think globally, act locally. Uh, so you're, I think what you're saying is that that's an element of the success that you had in Richmond. And since your book is entitled Refinery Town, and since the refinery is Chevron, let's talk a little bit about the relationship that uh, the new progressive majority in Richmond has with Chevron. How is, I, I assume that Chevron put big money into uh, trying to prevent uh, this new government from coming in. Uh, they didn't succeed. What's the relationship now? What's the interaction been like between Chevron and the leadership in Richmond? Well, Chevron's had a refinery here in Richmond since uh, 1905 when the company was known as Standard Oil of California. It's, uh, it was long dominant throughout much of the, the 20th century in, in local politics, understandably, as the largest employer one of the biggest corporations, what became one of the biggest corporations in the country. Uh, locally, Chevron has been very savvy in the way it's tried to wield political influence. It's uh, big into philanthropy. Uh, it buys uh, the support of uh, all kinds of uh, nonprofits. It uh, contributes to a lot of good causes. It befriends uh, African-American ministers and their programs. And then, of course, it runs candidates and donates to them directly and spends millions of dollars independently on their behalf. So uh, what's at stake for them is uh, the fact that new people have emerged in city politics who want to make the refinery safer, who want to form a blue-green alliance with uh, some of the refinery workers who share concerns about uh, the company's practices and how they impact both workers and the community. And then, of course, there's the larger issue of global warming. How do we move eventually, uh, transition from the kind of jobs that several thousand people depend on in the refinery uh, to uh, green jobs, so and an and and economy less dependent on on fossil fuel. Tough questions in a refinery town, both for workers, refinery neighbors, and community leaders. So you guys, by being in that kind of town, one, I think you've created a model for how to win against that kind of wealth and power. Two, I would say is very. It's going to be very interesting to to watch it unfold in terms of what the city government is able to do to uh, about issues like uh, climate change and environmental safety. But again, going back to the model, the idea that you guys have a model, there are other towns where big industry and local government intersect, even right there in your sort of refinery corridor of California, there's Martinez and, and Vallejo and so on. But are all around the country, there are places where there's a town in Maine where where oil is, is mass imported. There are towns that have had to deal with pipeline issues and so on. So is it fair to say in concluding, Steve Early, that, uh, that Richmond does provide a model for progressive uh, political action in, in, and a way forward in the years to come? Uh, very definitely. I mean, we all live in a company town of one sort or another in Silicon Valley, high tech companies, Berkeley nearby, it's the University of California, the main and dominant employer. Uh, pick your town and there's usually one big uh, company that uh, has a lot of clout and sway and uh, you've got to figure out how to uh, overcome the divide and conquer strategies that a lot of these employers uh, utilize to keep workers in the community apart, environmentalists pitted against workers, blacks pitted against whites, blacks pitted against Latinos. And, you know, the, the inspiring part of the Richmond story is uh, the degree to which people have succeeded here in, in coming together, forming a united front that can win elections and uh, make real changes at the city level at least. Well, I think you've done a great job of documenting that, and I think the uh, Alliance there in Richmond has done a great job of, of moving forward. Obviously, they're not going to give up, and the struggle is going to go on, and there are going to be threats and dangers in, in the years to come. We're going to be following this story. I hope you'll come back on at some point and talk to us about it. But in the meantime, the book is Refinery Town, Big Oil, Big Money, and the Remaking of an American city. Steve Early, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me.